P. Providence Branch, thank you for your support. Uh, President Andy Workman uh, and his wife Mary Beth are here with us this evening. And um, I want to welcome back uh, Tiffany Williams, uh, who was a former MLK Day uh, speaker, um, a retired administrative law judge uh, and former um, Assistant Deputy Secretary of State in New Jersey. Welcome back. And I want to give a special thank you to uh, the good folks at Nixon Peabody for their support uh, of this series and of our annual uh, diversity dinner symposium. Uh, Andy Prescott, the managing partner of the firm, uh, is here. Uh, they also have the, um, the good sense uh, to hire uh, many of our best and brightest. Um, couple who will be joining us later, but uh, one of whom is here right now, Megan Hopkins, known probably to those of you on the faculty as Megan Kruger, um, who is now an associate at Nixon Peabody. So welcome, Megan. And to bring greetings from the firm uh, tonight, uh, I'm uh, proud to introduce uh, Jeff Brenner, who is a partner at uh, Nixon Peabody in the uh, the Providence Office, leader of the Construction and Real Estate Litigation Practice Group. Um, Jeff is going to talk to us a little bit as well about um, the importance of a fair and equitable criminal justice system. And uh, Jeff, welcome. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Dean Yelnaski, for the warm introduction. Um, as an alumna, it's particularly exciting for me to be here with you today and speak to you. Um, I prefer to be on this side of the bench rather than that side. So, um, Nixon Peabody is once again pleased to co-sponsor the annual Martin Luther King Jr. Lecture, a critically important event that uh, captures Dr. King's life and legacy by inviting conversation about some of the nation's most important and most pressing civil rights and social justice issues. Many of the themes that resonate from Dr. King's legacy, and which I'm sure will be echoed by our speaker today, are embedded in the work that we do at Nixon Peabody and the values we speak to emulate firm-wide on a daily basis. Um, as Dean Yelnaski mentioned, uh, my colleague Jeff Brenner is here, and I'd like to begin uh, by letting him speak a little bit about uh, some pro bono work that he recently completed that is particularly profound. So, Jeff? Thanks, Megan. Um, so they asked me for a picture of um, this matter I did, and, and I said, if I'm going to give you a picture, I know there's going to be judges here, and I see Judge Sutel, Clifton, and Matos. I say, they're going to give me crap forever if, they, if you have a picture up and I can't explain it. <laughs> so um, this is in our office, and this is me with a, uh, a pro bono client of ours, Kevin Lockhart. Um, Kevin uh, is maybe about two or three years younger than me, uh, but his life path was a little bit different. Uh, in the early 90s, he had had a pretty long uh, rap sheet of, of drug possession, uh, then drug, you know, dealing, and one of the times he had a knife on him, which was never used, but it was a very long rap sheet, and he ended up uh, uh, getting a 30-year sentence for jail from uh, uh, Judge Laguerre, not because he wanted to, but because he had to, under the minimum sentencing guidelines that were in place in the early 90s. Um, and, Kev, and I got to meet Kevin through what was called the Clemency 2014 Project, which some of you may know that that was an initiative established by President Obama under the Department of Justice to identify nonviolent prisoners who are in, you know, in jail for a very long time and, and wh what are they doing there. And you know, you, know, you can you know, rationalize it in a bunch of different ways. One, one way you can rationalize it is if someone went in there, aren't we supposed to be rehabilitating? And if they had a drug issue, aren't we supposed to be addressing that? Uh, in Kevin's situation, and this is more about a story about him than, than me and my firm, Kevin was a model prisoner. Uh, he went in, uh, got himself dried out, 
pretty quickly uh, within you know within a few years. And unfortunately, um, the way the system was in the 90s, I know this is going to be uh, getting into the the, the speaker's uh, domain. The only way to dry out was to go to jail. And, and I, I personally think that's just wrong. I mean, this, isn't a, this is not a race story. This is a story about what are we in society doing about, about with people who have issues that, that need help. Um, he then developed a uh, list of accomplishments in prison uh, by way of courses and certificates and things that I don't even understand that was a lot longer than his rap sheet that he got in, in the first place. And uh, even better, he kept in touch with his family. His family kept in touch with him. Uh, he has two children who are currently uh, in college. One's at Johnson & Wales and one's at Montana State playing D2 basketball. Um, uh, their mother kept in touch with him, his mother, his aunt. And I, I would have uh, phone calls from all these people, extended family members, which was great, because a lot of times, and the judges know this, when they see the sentencing reports, the family gives up on them, and they give up on the family, and that never happened here. So they made it easy for me to tell Kevin's story uh, and to get his sentence commuted by 10 years. When you're, in your, when you're around 50 years old, there's a big difference between being in jail until you're 60 and when getting out in your fifth, and when you're 50. And I've been in touch with him since he was um, um, left, left the prison system at the end of 2017, but was in the, the so-called halfway houses in the Boston area uh, to make sure that he you know, is who he was supposed to be, which he was. Um, he was able to get a job at the Coca-Cola bottling plant in, in Needham doesn't mind working 70 hour weeks because he's like I hadn't worked in 20 years being in jail I'll, I'll work whatever shift you want me to and um, uh, last month uh, like about two weeks or so before Christmas he just showed up in my office uh, most of my clients don't do that pro bono or paying um, but he so he just showed up at the office and and we kind of dressed alike that day I was uh, it was an office day for me after traveling a couple days during the week and I don't know if you can tell, but he brought me this like 20 pound glass object that has this really strong base and it's a hand blown glass object and it's inscribed just to show his appreciation. Now I never met him before and, and some of you who are in Providence, you, um, you know, if you've been to our building, Citizens Plaza and Cafe La France, yeah, I met him down there because I mean, you know, I'd never met him. He wasn't on our list, uh, you know, let up in the, in the elevator. So I came down and we, you know, we've never met each other. So at, at, with the, uh, you know, coffee person as my witness, you know, he just gave me a big hug and just started crying on my chest. And, you know, God put me on the planet to get him out of prison 10 years early. And I'm like, okay, I'll take that. And, um, <laughs> uh, you know, it was, it was a very touching moment. Um, you know, I, I represent a lot of different clients. Uh, you know, some I might like, some I might not, but I try to do the best I can for them. And I felt very good about helping out Kevin and giving him 10 years of his life back, taking him out of a federal prison system that, that didn't need him and he didn't need it, saving the taxpayers, I don't know, what's it cost? Uh, Aaron, you might know, is it close to $100,000 a year uh, to incarcerate somebody? I mean, that's, you know, that's a money that can be spelt, spent elsewhere and really giving this guy his life back. So this was an initiative that Nixon Peabody um, participated in around the, around the firm. Chuck Tammy Levitt, some of you might know, is a former prosecutor, now defense attorney, you know, helped me out understanding a lot of the bizarre terminology that the, that the prosecutors and the criminal defense guys use and, and helped me write up the, you know, the, his story to, to tell so that we could get his sentence commuted. So um, afterward, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions, but I didn't want to go beyond the few minutes just talking about this initiative. So thank you for your listening. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. I asked him to bring the sculpture, but it was too heavy. It, it is very heavy. Um, so in addition to working on the projects like Jeff described, members of our Providence office have uh, participated in a number of pro bono initiatives. Uh, most recently, we began working with the Sojourner House on its trafficking, housing, empowerment, immigration, and advocacy project through which 
Uh, members of our office assist vis victims of human trafficking with expunging their criminal records. Many of them have records um, that list charges related to uh, prostitution or loitering offenses as a result of being sexually trafficked. Uh, additionally, many of our offices nationwide handle Criminal Justice Act matters on a pro bono basis, and Nixon Peabody is actually one of only two law firms that assist the Innocence Project with conducting in-depth investigations and vetting applications for individuals who claim that they've been wrongfully convicted to determine whether or not they might be able to be exonerated through DNA evidence. In addition to our pro bono efforts, Nixon Peabody is committed to its diversity inclusion efforts. Uh, most recently, on December 7th of last year, Nixon Peabody participated in what was called the International, I'm sorry, the National Day of Understanding, which was organized by the CEO Action for Diversity Inclusion. This event grew out of the tragic fatal shooting of a man of color, Botham Jean, in his Dallas apartment by a white off-duty policewoman. On the Day of Understanding, Nixon Peabody staff and its attorneys nationwide gathered together to learn and practice a paradigm for discussing in both a respectful and productive manner challenging issues related to uh, race relations and diversity. Uh, Andrew, as our office managing partner, did a great job facilitating this program, and I'm not just saying that because he asked me to in an email earlier today and because he's sitting in the front row. Uh, he really did do a great job. I personally participated in the program along with uh, the other attorneys and staff in our Providence office, and I found it to be both thought-provoking, challenging, and rewarding. Um, I'm grateful to work at a firm like Nixon Peabody that shares and builds on the very principles that were so deeply rooted within my legal education here at Roger Williams, so I feel very fortunate to be uh, at a firm that uh, values and expands and grows on those principles every day. The firm received overwhelmingly positive feedback with respect to the Day of Understanding and is intending to build on that momentum with more diversity-focused programming. So in closing, on behalf of Nixon Peabody, I want to thank the law school for the opportunity to again co-sponsor this important event. We look forward to listening with intent and purpose to what District Attorney Rollins has to share today. Thank you again. It is my great pleasure to introduce uh, our Director of Diversity and Inclusion, Deborah Johnson, who will introduce her friend, uh, District Attorney Rachel Rollins. Um, I, I do want to take this opportunity to thank Deborah for the terrific work that she has done making this series a signature event uh, at the law school. Uh, and it is with um, great admiration that, uh, that I welcome her to the podium. Thank you, Michael, and welcome to everybody. It is wonderful to see all of you here this afternoon. And I know that you didn't come to hear any of us speak. You were waiting for uh, District Attorney Rollins, so I'm gonna be really brief. Um, but I had to take a few moments to introduce uh, our MLK speaker this afternoon, and I've been trying to think about what I wanted to say, and there really is just way too much for me to say in a very short period of time. Um, I feel like I've known her forever, um, even though I haven't, but I feel like I've known for at least my entire legal career and I have admired her throughout that time. I remember as a first year uh, law student at Northeastern uh, that Rachel was not, we weren't classmates, we weren't even schoolmates, she graduated the May before I started, but when I got there she was already legendary and uh, people were talking about her left and right, and perhaps that was because even then she was already a visionary and an incredible leader. Um, among other things, she was the first ever legal intern for the National Basketball Players Association, and later I might add, worked for the National Football League, League Players Association, and in fact she's a woman of many firsts. First woman of color to serve as general counsel of the Massachusetts Department of Transportation, the first woman to serve as general counsel of the Massachusetts Bay Transportation Authority, which I always found fascinating because I know that 
Rachel does not like to take the tea. (laughs) (laughs) Moving on. (laughs) And of course, today she is here and she is the first woman of color to serve as district attorney in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and the first woman elected as DA in Suffolk County, the county in which Boston sits. I feel like I should take just a moment to read her short bio, Um, and I'm gonna focus on short. There's, again, so much to know about her, but I want, for those of you who are law students in the audience in particular, to listen, because I think that Rachel and her accomplishments are a shining example of what one can do with their law degree. So Rachel's been a lawyer for over 20 years, and as a This is a little, uh, this is dated now. As a former state and federal prosecutor, she has handled cases involving civil rights violations, fraud, sexual predators, narcotics, violence, and weapons. She also clerked on the Massachusetts Appeals Court, and before that she was at a firm and she worked for the National Labor Relations Board. That's not even in here. Um, She was the general counsel, as I said, of both the MBTA and the Mass DOT, and in those roles, she managed over 150 employees and was responsible for overseeing thousands of cases per year. She left to become the chief legal counsel for the Massachusetts Port Authority. She has served on Attorney General Maura Healy's advisory council on racial justice and equity. She's a former uh, Governor Deval Patrick appointee to the Judicial Nominating Commission, a past president of the Massachusetts Black Lawyers Association, and was elected and served a three-year term on the Boston Bar Association Council. And as I said, that's just the short version. Over the years, I have uh, got, had a chance to get to know Rachel, and as you can see, I hope you can see, or at least I've heard, she really is an amazing woman. Um, She's thoughtful and she's strategic, she's outspoken, and she truly is wise beyond her years. She has been a mentor to me, and she has repeatedly shared just amazing, excellent pieces of wisdom. She gives you the real talk, she doesn't play around, and she's about getting things done. And so as I've gotten to know her over the years, I've come to admire her more and more, not just for her many accomplishments, but for the many ways in which she has led and blazed the trails for those alongside and behind her. And I would just note that in this room alone, there are three women who have benefited, had the direct benefit of her excellence and her leadership. And that's Tara Allen, Northeastern class of 98, Tiffany Williams, (laughs) (laughs) Tiffany Williams, class of 99, and yours truly, Deborah Johnson, class of 2000, Rachel was class of 97. So I know that I can speak on behalf of all of us in saying thank you, Rachel. And with that, I am honored and overjoyed to introduce to you my friend, my mentor, my role model, and my district attorney, Rachel Rollins. Thank you so much. Um, So I wanna, first of all, uh, thank my three friends here from my fabulous my fabulous law school, Northeastern. Um, Dean, I appreciate you allowing me to come on campus um, and speak to you guys. I, I think I wanna, every time I talk, I love leaving plenty of time at the end for you guys to ask whatever question you want. Like, if you're thinking about running for office that isn't the district attorney's office, I am a first in many, many, or, or the district attorney's office, but I'm a first in many circumstances. As a 47-year-old, I've never run for office before. I didn't choose a small office. I chose one that ha- that is all of Boston and three other places as well. Um, but I wanna break this up into sort of three sections, a little bit about me, Um, and my platform, six points that I love to try to give out to people when they hear like all the things they think I'm really good at um, and how I try to focus my life right now, and then questions. So if you would oblige, um, the little bit about me I just wanna tell you is uh, I'm the oldest of five children. I'm 47 right now. I think one of my superpowers is that I was blessed to be born into a a multicultural home. Uh, My father is Irish American um, from South Boston. If any of you are are familiar with Boston, think of the most racist place on earth in Cubit, um, and then add to, and that is what South Boston was when my dad was growing up. Um, And my mom's family's from Barbados, and they met 
uh, some 48 years ago and started a family. Um, I'm the oldest of five children and um, I have siblings. Uh, I have a sibling right now that is currently incarcerated. And so I like to say that out loud to people. I'm the district attorney of Suffolk County. I have a younger brother that's currently incarcerated. And there are more people like me uh, than you would like to believe, that wake up and go to work every day, that make good decisions. When I speak to young people, which is my favorite group of people to speak to, it is not, um, it is completely okay for you to love someone and not agree with the decisions that they make. It does not make you a traitor to your family. It does not make you a traitor to your community. You can live in a home that you might not agree with a lot of the things that are happening there as a child. Um, but I love my siblings. Uh, I don't support necessarily some of the decisions they've made. But I know firsthand what it feels like to sit in a courtroom the very courtroom I used to prosecute people in at the U.S. Attorney's Office, the Moakley Courthouse, I've prosecuted people in and I've sat in as my brother was sentenced. And those are the experiences I brought to the campaign trail and that I bring every day to work with me. Um, as a result of my siblings, I have four of them, uh, three of them have struggled with either opioid addiction or cycled in and out of the criminal justice system. As a result of that, I'm the guardian of two of my nieces. So I also know what it feels like to have DCF, which is in Massachusetts, what we call the Department of Children and Families. It used to be the Department of Social Services. I don't know what you call it in your state. Uh, but I have DCF involvement in my life, not because a 51A has been filed against me, but because I s answered my phone one day and was told that one of my siblings um, was gonna lose custody of their child and my niece was gonna go into a foster home. And I said, oh no, 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 um, of course not. And they said, it'll be a week tops. And that was three years ago. <laughs> so best thing that ever happened in my life that I stood up and did that. But it was something that um, I know what it feels like to have DCF involved in your life, to have them call and say, we're gonna be at your house uh, tomorrow at noon for a house visit. Now, because I'm me, I can say back to them, even before I was the DA, no you aren't, that doesn't work for me. Um, you can come on this day at this time, but there are not a lot of people that have that skill set or feel comfortable enough when they are the target of a DCF investigation, for example. I'm a foster parent, so I'm a, what's called a kinship foster parent. Um, you know, what I, what I like to say is I like to take advantage of opportunities that present themselves whether you want them to be there or not. So I stepped up as a kinship foster parent which is different than a foster parent. And what I did was I took the MAP class which in Massachusetts is the parenting class you take to become a foster parent. And then I am now on the emergency list in Massachusetts. So when an emergency occurs and a 51A is filed, I get a phone call in the middle of the night and am told that there are siblings that were just removed from a home after the police did a raid, or very recently now, an overdose happened. And a nine-year-old girl or boy made a phone call because their mother or father was unconscious and they thought they were dead. What I love about my house, it's not big, but we just have like a million bunk beds because I have 40 extra children that I did not <laughs> give birth to and my nieces. Um, but we have bunk beds and so I like taking siblings because I like saying this out loud to people who think, how can I help, what can I do? It is a night, it's usually at 10 or 11 p.m. Um, and you, they pick the child up or the children up the next day, but you just provide a clean place for them to sleep, food and snacks. I have a, an adorable French Bulldog. It's just an opportunity for them to feel safe on literally the worst night of their life. Um, and that is something that I stepped up and did. Um, and ironically, still as the DA, I'm still on the emergency list. I don't take anyone from Suffolk County because as we know, oftentimes families that are involved with one agency end up being involved in others. And if a 51A is filed, it's usually a mandated reporter and there might be some criminal um, charges coming. But I wanna tell you that about my background because I think it's really important to hear that I bring that lived experience to work with me every single day when I sit down as the district attorney making decisions in Suffolk County. Um, so that's my background. A little bit about my platform, it's very simple. I had made it 
very clear that under my administration, we were going to stop criminalizing mental illness, addiction, and poverty. We do that every single day in our criminal justice system. So prisons are the new asylums. Um, in Massachusetts, in the House of Correction, over 67% of the women that are currently in our House of Correction are suffering from a diagnosed um, mental illness in the DSM-5. So not that person looks sort of, there's something off with her or him. We mean a diagnosed uh, DSM-5 uh, mental illness. Um, with respect to addiction, I really believe in services, not sentences, I like to say. And I believe that you should not be getting your treatment at the House of Corrections when we in Massachusetts pride ourselves of being sort of the bedrock of all of um, every you know, fabulous hospital and people are flying from around the world to come to us. There's all this money that people are given for treatment. I don't think people should be getting their treatment in the Suffolk County House of Corrections. And then with respect to poverty, um, not race, I want you to hear me say this, poverty is actually um, the biggest dis like the biggest disparity in the criminal justice system is people that are poor don't get good services at all, irrespective of what color you are. So there's a lot of people in Charlestown, which is within Suffolk County, if you're from there, I don't know what the equivalent is in Rhode Island, but who are living in a housing project and don't get treated with dignity or respect or get what they believe is good service and treatment from the criminal justice system, just like somebody who might be from Roxbury, which is another area of Suffolk County um, that is a little bit more sort of urban. Um, and I believe your zip code should not determine the outcome of your case. Um, and I say that out loud as often as I can. Um, another principle which I don't think should be earth shattering but was in my campaign is I believe people should be treated with dignity and fairness um, and respect in the process. I think we have completely lost track of the fact that the, the, the district attorney's office is funded by tax dollars that we are in the service industry and we should be um, acting as such. And um, victims and survivors and defendants, we actually represent all of them. I'm aware that defendants have their own counsel, but they are members of Suffolk County as well. And if you practice, how many of you have practiced criminal law? All right. So. Is it shocking to hear that victims are often defendants and then defendants can then also be victims? All the time, right? And so if you're somebody who has practiced in a district court, um, I, I, you know, sort of made my way in the U.S. Attorney's Office I'm in, in Massachusetts, um, but I did a district attorney rotation when I was in law school at, uh, I'm sorry, when I was at a law firm at, in a town uh, called Brockton which very candidly makes Boston's crime look like, you know, your dog was not on the leash, right? And so, uh, <laughs> like, so what I can tell you is um, Brockton is hardcore. Uh, and so I learned quite a bit there. And, and even in my four month rotation, I saw the same people or I'd see somebody and then I'd say, I know that last name. And they'd say, oh, that's his father or that's his uncle or that's her mother, you know, or sister. And then later, that same individual that we had charged with something was the victim of a, you know, a violent attack of some other sort or um, had been shot or something like that had happened. So I believe that we need to start talking about the fact that although we don't stand up in court and represent defendants, their families deserve to know when cases are continued. And what we do frequently is we make sure the victim's family and the witnesses know, but we never reach out to what's called in Massachusetts CPCS or the public defender there. We need to make sure we're, we're more transparent with what we're doing. Um, and, and the last part of me is I think some news was made about me because during the campaign, I said out loud that there are gonna be 15 crimes um, that overwhelmingly are crimes of mental illness, addiction, and poverty, that in the first instance, prosecution is not gonna be the answer. Just flat out, if it's a first offense, we're just outright null processing or dismissing this. Be and so things like trespassing, um, or things like breaking and entering into an abandoned property for the purpose of seeking shelter. Um, so, you know, I know you guys are like, 
think you're down south or something in Rhode Island. It's freezing in Boston. And in the, I don't even know if we're south or north or where we drove. <laughs> you get what I mean. But my point is that if you are homeless and you break into you know, an abandoned space uh, somewhere in downtown Boston and the choice you're making is whether you want to freeze to death or live, I don't think we should be criminalizing that. What I want to do is pre-arraignment look at this person and say, what happened? What's, what's going on with you? And I believe we are problem solvers. Um, for sure, when we move out of the district court and, and we indict up into superior court, there are more serious crimes, there are more violent crimes. Um, not to say we don't ask what happened in those circumstances, but it is right now in Suffolk County a very adversarial process, even in district court. I don't think it needs to be. I think that we are both often looking at individuals that are suffering in that moment. And what I'd rather do is say, this person's homeless, let's find them a shelter. Let's, if, if it's a location where they've done this three or four times, we can give them a civil stay away order. No one's saying you don't hold them accountable, but it does not always, accountability does not have to equal jail. So those are some of the things I said out loud and people lost their minds. Um, but what I love about it is I said it out loud pre-primary. Um, it was just that everyone else assumed somebody that the sitting DA and all of the police were endorsing was gonna win and so nobody listened. And so September 4th, I won um, and woke up to all of these calls from the media. I was on Tucker Carlson because that's who I am. I firmly believe I don't wanna to speak to people that agree with me. I think we need to start having conversations with people that don't agree with you. And if you can be pleasant and firm, but pleasant during that conversation, that's where the change is gonna happen. I don't need to sit around with people that say like, you're amazing, I love hearing that, but we're not making any progress when that happens. So I'm the person that calls up Howie Carr, I'm the person that goes on Tucker Carlson or Jeff Cooner or conservative radio um, as often as I can because when it ends and they say like, well, you're not completely crazy, that's a win, right? Um, that it is, it is, I firmly believe that. So the other thing that very recently happened is I've said out loud, and I know there's a US attorney here, but I came from the federal government. I am a former assistant US attorney. Andy Lelling, our US attorney in Massachusetts, was a former colleague of mine. Um, but I've been really vocal about the fact that when people are walking into courthouses in Suffolk County and are being detained by ICE, I firmly believe that there are safe zones like hospitals and schools and churches and yes, courthouses in the public sections of courthouses. I don't believe I should be snatching people um, in public areas in courthouses because there's too much good work that we do in courthouses. Now, I will say that, you know, when people push back and say, you know, well, are, you don't believe that ICE can, that's a different conversation. I'm not saying ICE does not have the right to deport people. We can talk when I take my district attorney coat off and I can tell you as an individual what I believe, but as the DA of Suffolk County, it is my job to make sure people come to court, that witnesses and victims and families come to court. There are civil matters that aren't happening right now because people are terrified that they could be deported. When you wanna file a restraining order against someone, that's not a criminal matter, it's a civil procedure. When you wanna section somebody, if you have a loved one that's suffering from a mental health issue or substance use disorder and you want them sectioned, it's not criminal, you're afraid to go in there um, if they have a questionable uh, immigration status. Um, domestic, people with domestic violence issues um, are saying, all I want is for the violence to stop. I'm not saying I want him or her deported above and beyond that. I just want this behavior to stop. So it is my job to stand up and say that irrespective of what the person's charged with, I want to hold them accountable in Suffolk County prior to ICE coming in, and I, I need to make sure that courthouses are working the way they should. Um, and so recently I said that, and 4,000 you know, news media outlets rained down upon me, but I will say it again, I firmly believe that. Um, I want to just tell you guys very quickly before I open it up to whatever questions you want, just the six things that 
you know, we are super proud in my campaign of what we did. There were five Democratic uh, candidates. Everyone said that the black vote would, there were three black um, uh, candidates and three progressive candidates. They said the progressive vote would um, knock itself out and so would the black vote and that no, this individual was gonna win. We won with 42% of the overall um, vote in the primary and then with 82% in the general. So for me it was important not to boast about that, but you need a mandate for change. I would have happily taken a 51% to a 49, but when people say to me, because a win is a win, right? <laughs> like, but, but I will tell you, when people say like, oh, what's going on and you're, this is unbelievable, I was very transparent about what it is I was running on prior to the primary and the people have spoken and I don't report to anyone but the voters and if you have a problem with that, I will see you in four years when we're running again and hopefully you can become the district attorney and do something different. So. Um, some of the things that just I love to say to people generally um, is, you know, six little things that I hope you take and then I'll open it up for questions. The first one is I want to encourage everyone here to be grateful, right? I don't care what your religion is, um, I don't care what you believe in or don't believe in, but in this role in three weeks that I've been the DA, we've had four homicides in Massachusetts, in Boston. Um, and I realize now that I've gone to crime scenes and seen the aftermath of violence, that every morning when you wake up, it is a day to be grateful for. I don't care how terrible your life is right now, you are alive and that's more than four people that I've seen myself can say about this. So in the very first instance and in my line of work, um, every morning when I wake up, even if it's just for five seconds, I'm like, Thank you, right? I am alive, and then it deter I determine you know, what my day is gonna be like. So the first thing is be grateful. The second thing is be deliberate. I love to say, and it sounds cocky, but I'm good at everything I do, because I only do three things, right? So <laughs> the people that do too much, if you are mediocre at everything, like, good luck. And I've used to be that person where I was like, awesome, I'm a horrible mom, I'm failing at work, I'm juggling too many things, and that's the problem. We need to be very deliberate about what we're doing. I can talk to you personally about running for office. I thought very long and hard about what I was gonna do. In the same way for lawyers, it's like, what does my closing argument look like? If in the beginning you aren't thinking about how you're winning this case later on and you're just randomly getting phone calls from police officers or federal agents and not thinking about what is my theory of the case, what is my closing argument gonna be, you are at the whim of whatever it is that happened. So I am deliberate, I have a plan. Either before I go to bed, I say what I'm gonna do the next day, or that morning after I'm like, I'm alive, I'm grateful, this is my list of 18 things I wanna do, that is a huge accomplishment. I only get three things done on my list of 18 because everything else happens, but then those 15 things go to the next day, but there's at least a chronicling. And for the young people, as you get older, I am constantly in a state of, if I don't write things down, like what, you remember Russell Crowe at the end of A Beautiful Mind with all the papers everywhere? Like, I just, I feel like I'm slowly entering that. I have to make sure that I am deliberate about what I'm doing, writing down what my intentions are. I say this to everyone, but mostly the women in the room, know your worth. The greatest thing that ever happened to me was I know what I am worth. And not just money-wise, it makes things so easy. You have to think about things before they happen. There were two jobs that I was offered prior to running for, di for district attorney. Um, and, and what I want to say to you is that, you know, I... I, part of my story that some people know and others don't, is June 16th, 2016, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. I've been healthy my whole life. Part of my story is I was a, a, a scholarship athlete at, um, hi, I was a scholarship athlete at uh, UMass Amherst, received a full scholarship. Um, our teams were cut, three women's teams were cut. And the men's football team that hadn't won a game in two years at all, had 75 full scholarships for their entirely stinky, non-successful team. 
our three women's teams that lost scholarships on my lacrosse team of the 15 women that were playing we only had three full scholarships I was one of them they cut those three and this is back in like 1990 when nobody really knew what title nine was I certainly didn't but I knew what fairness and equity and justice was and we got a lawyer and we we threatened a lawsuit and got all three of our teams reinstated which is great but what I can tell you is I when I was diagnosed with breast cancer I knew that I was in for the fight of my life. And what I chose to do was say, until they tell me you are dying, I'm gonna be upbeat and positive. I have a 15 year old daughter right now, uh, two years ago she was 13, and I had two nieces. And I made sure that I was deliberate about what I did every day. I, I got all the treatment I needed. I'm happy to say that I'm cancer free right now, which is awesome, but yes, it's great. But there is nothing like cancer to make you wake up and say, um, you are not promised every single day and I'm gonna do everything I ever wanted to do. And if somebody tells me I can't do it, I'm gonna do it harder, right? right? And better. Um, so again, it also opened up my eyes and I know what my worth is. I've been, I was offered two jobs before I decided to run and we had discussed a number of what my salary was gonna be, and when they offered it to me, it was $10,000 less than the number they said. And I found myself saying like, getting ready to open my mouth, like, you know that you said, and I said, thank you so much. Um, that's a hard no. Have a great day. <laughs> and, and hung up the phone. And didn't pick up the phone for, for a week or two, and was completely fine, because when you know your worth, you do. And they came back and offered me, you know, 5,000 more than the 10 that they had been off, but they had already shown me who they were. And so when they called back and said that, I said, thank you so much. That's a hard no. Um, and what's, a, what's ironic is they do tons of work with the DA's office. And I said, um, they're ROCA, actually. It's a wonderful program. And I have a great relationship with them now. But I said, N no. I think I'll be district attorney instead. We'll work together that way. Um, and, and, if, and here we are, right? All right, so the fourth thing is focus on you. And I like to say this, it's like everyone lies and there are haters everywhere. So I have a 15 year old daughter. I, I always give her this shout out. She is an amazing track athlete. Like not just a parent like, oh, she's really good and she beat my uncle. No, no, no. she's. <laughs> She is number one in the country, in the United States of America, in the 55 meter hurdles, the 100 meter hurdles, and the 200 meter hurdles. And she's amazing. So what's great though is when she was younger, I remember watching one of her track meets and uh, she was running the 200 meter and a girl came up to her and whispered something to her before the, the meet started. And Peyton ran and she didn't run the time that she was normally running and she looked distracted and I'm like, well, what's going on, what happened? And she said, that girl just told me, now Peyton was like nine at the time, she just, she told me she ran a 25 in the 200. And if anyone runs track, which clearly none of you do, cause you're like, what does that mean? But a 25 is like, if you were nine and running a 25, you wouldn't be here. You'd be in the Olympics in Rio, like breaking world records. So I was like, why, what, why did you even listen to what she said? And she said, but she seemed like she was telling me the truth. And so I just said like, you're getting psyched out, stop listening. So I cannot tell you how many people said to me in every job I've had, like there's never been a woman that's done this before. There's never been a visible person of color that's done this before. Um, you know, no, no, there's no way Boston as um, you know, segregated as it is, you can win being the district attorney. You gotta put all the noise out of your head and just focus on doing the work. Um, but I also say when I say focus on you, it's really important in this line of work that you, your emotional well-being is, is a priority and your mental health. Um, because what I can tell you is if you do not take control of what it is um, that you require in your life, your job will suck you dry and, and you will be found dead under your desk and a custodian will sweep you out and there'll be a new employee that's like placed there. So on the tombstone, I love when people say it never says like w worked 
to the, her fingers to the bone and everyone loved. It's like you, you're going to look back on your life and wish that you had done the things that were really important to you. If you don't grasp that time, it's, it's, it's not going to be positive. Um, the last two that I will say to you is always do what's right, not easy. I go back to my immigration statement. I go back to my list of 15. Um, you, you know, if you choose to read the comments of what's happening, some of them are absolutely hilarious when people write articles about you. But if, for me, I don't care if there are conservative people saying all types of hilarious things about me because I believe um, that courthouses should be safe zones. Um, if it's right, it doesn't matter if you're vilified. You have to do what's right, and certainly if you're an elected official. And then the last thing I will end with before opening it up to questions is, Every time people hear about like, oh, you know, went to this law school and has this degree and won this award and is the first this and first last, I love to tell people I fail all the time. I have failed so many times in my life. There are so many jobs that I was sure I was gonna get that I didn't get, even get a call for. Um, there are failures I've had, there are mistakes I've made um, that, you know, when I was younger that are still disclosable mistakes. Um, for those of you in the federal government, when you fill out a form and they say, you know, have you ever been arrested or charged with a crime? When I was 19, I was charged uh, with larceny under 250. And during the campaign, that came out. And I like to tell this to young people because the way the Herald wrote it, you would think that I had like stolen a car, was driving 300 miles an hour, throwing cocaine and like $100 <laughs> bills out of a, you know, a, a convertible while shooting off an assault rifle. <laughs> what actually happened was I walked out to my mailbox and there was a summons in the mail, right? And they said I was arrested when, even lawyers, when you think of arrest, you think of a handcuff situation, you think of fingerprinted, none of that had happened. Um, but I made a stupid mistake, and I was 19 years old, and I was told at the time, quaff it, it'll never come up again in your life. <laughs> and I laugh, and what's interesting, I got the Globe endorsement, and when I was interviewing with the Globe editorial board, somebody said, why didn't you just seal your record? Like, what is wrong with you? You're dealing with all these questions right now. And I said, because I am 47 years old and I'm still answering for this. You haven't asked me about the American Association of University Women Fellowship I won, or the fact that I'm a 40 under 40 recipient in Boston. I went to Harvard Business School. You didn't ask any of that. You asked about my arrest. And I'm gonna be fine, because I'm gonna be the district attorney. But think about a young Dominican person who's 17 years old, who has a felony. What is happening with her or him? Or think about somebody from Charlestown who's 21, who has two parents that are addicts or doesn't know where their father is or ever met him or her and has a criminal record. What is their life like? That's why I need to be the DA, because we need Corey reform. We need to make sure we're getting people jobs and sealing their records, or I'm gonna be hiring people with Corey's as the DA. So when I go to General Electric and all these other places in Boston and say, oh, you will hire them, because if the DA can hire them vertex can like I don't even know what you do vertex but nobody's stealing your stuff so but that's my beef with vertex which I'm going to talk about later um, but all jokes aside I just need you to hear failure happens where people are exceptional is how quickly you react after you fail are you somebody who wallows in failure? Are you somebody who thinks about it forever? Are you sadness in the movie Inside Out? Which, if you have not seen that, it's wonderful. Um, but don't be sadness. What you need to do is learn from that mistake and then pick yourself up and start moving on to the next thing. So those are my six things I love telling people. I want to open it up to whatever questions you have. No question is stupid. Um, Honestly, like if it's about running for office, if it's about my office in particular, um, if it's about something I said or anything else, I'd love to answer whatever questions you have. So as you will see, there are some microphones. Um, if you would come to them uh, to ask your question, uh, that would be great. Judge Clifton, you get your first. Yay. Andy will not come and stand behind that. <laughs> Somebody has to be first. You know? 
Thank you. Um, listening to your platform, one of the things, and please don't take this as a criticism. I love uh, criticism. There's only a limit as to what any human being can do. But just two days ago, we witnessed all of us who watch TV something really ugly, and at least in my humble opinion. The scene in Washington, D.C., where you had the Native American and the group of young white teenagers from Covington High School in Kentucky. And let me just, I'm, I shouldn't, let me say this. We are all aware, those of us who are attorneys, that the First Amendment guarantees the right of freedom of speech, freedom of expression. We are also aware that uh, in the line of cases that have uh, delved into so-called fighting words that some things are constitutionally permissible and other things are not. They go beyond and they are considered fighting words. So for me, the phrase, make America great again, are fighting words. That phrase, in and of itself, is innocuous. But how it has been used over the last three years plus come, is a nothing more, to, to, at least again to me, is nothing more than um, an umbrella over hate speech to all people of color. So when you have a group of young folks in Washington, D.C., exercising their First Amendment right to uh, concerning the reproductive right, that's fine. But when you all assemble with these red hats, make America great again, it is difficult for me not to see that as an assault. It's fighting words directed at all people to whom are not find themselves in a safe zone in this United States right now. So this is my question. Hate speech, it still goes on in Boston. What would be, if this situation had happened in Boston, and if it had involved an adult, rather who was the, what I would call the provocateur, mm -hmm. what would be the position of your district attorney's office in whether or not to consider filing charges of violating, of exercising hate speech? Um, good question. I mean, we had something we had something happen during the campaign where somebody went on a rant. Um, there was two people on a motorcycle that were people of color, I think a black couple, um, that got lost. They were on a ride um, in honor of somebody that had died, I think, in a motorcycle accident. They got lost and turned off a road and went into a section of Dorchester that was um, apparently, uh, this individual was very upset that they were there. Um, he proceeds to start yelling racial slurs at them. The police are called and are watching what's happening. Um, they do nothing about the racial slurs, but the man is clearly having sort of a mental break and decides to kick a, a, like a telephone pole or something, which alerts Boston police and they arrest him for like malicious destruction of property, which to any person with any pigment in their skin says, right, because that's the crime, right, that's happening right now, not the racial slurs that are being screamed at these two people. Um, you know, and what I can tell you is that I am a firm believer, and I learned this at the U.S. Attorney's Office, there are times where you file charges. Of course, we have an ethical obligation to only file charges that we believe are, are crimes themselves, but justice does not have to be a guilty verdict. 
Sometimes justice is doing the right thing and filing a charge and starting a conversation um, and seeing what's gonna happen. Now what I find hilarious is the ACLU, who usually is supportive of a lot of the things that I do, would defend the, indiv the very individuals that made those statements. And we saw what, what's happened in Charlottesville. Ironically, I read an article, I think the Native American man that was banging the drum is a, is a veteran. And he's a Marine, in fact, as is my fabulous um, detail uh, detective Cecil. And so I love that tension where it's, you know, I love saying out loud, you know, the Second Amendment applies to us too, right? Like people of color, that same amendment, we can, we have a right to bear arms. Um, you know, and similarly, it's this fierce loyalism with respect to. Um, military service, except for when it's not somebody that you think it is who's been serving in the military. So I would say, you know, I'd want to look at those facts, but we are going to be bold in Boston, and we're not going to stand for behavior that is questionable. I like to also say, if I'm saying on the one hand, accountability doesn't have to equal incarceration, what I love now about social media, and I don't usually like social media because I'm old, uh, but, um, but I love that now people are being fully exposed for who they are, and although there might not be ramifications that are legal, um, if I heard the school shut down, right? Like, didn't some, am I, yeah. So there's, there's some different things that are happening um, with respect to people being held accountable in, in other ways. But, you know, I hear what you're saying. I'd have to look at exactly what our hate statute elements are. Um, but you bet I'm going to be, you know, one of the other things I want to be bold about is with civil asset forfeiture, which if you're not a lawyer, this is the ability, and I used to do this, so I want full disclosure, at the U.S. Attorney's Office, um, you know, we would civilly seize your property, which is, of course, a much lower standard. I've had circumstances where the underlying state criminal charges were dismissed, and we still civilly seized the property. Um, and, uh, and it was a home that was um, prior to marijuana being legal in the Commonwealth um, that was literally busting to the gills with marijuana plants. Um, and we seized the home and they had to liquidate uh, the asset. But I will tell you that with respect to civil asset forfeiture, I want my office to be going after employers. Right? Like, I don't want to be going after some 15-year-old kid in Dorchester and civilly seizing $82 in his pocket and a 382 Honda Civic from 1932. I don't, I don't want that. Um, what I want is the employers that are engaging in patterns and practice of wage theft, and they are targeting immigrants, and they are targeting poor people, um, and seize their assets, right? Or looking at... Um, white collar crimes potentially with my brothers and sisters in the US Attorney's Office and seeing if we can do stuff like that. But that's a long way to say, I wanna think creatively about it for sure. Sir. Thank you. Um, first, thank you so much for your talk. I, I loved listening to you and your ideas. So um, I am curious about your plans or at least what you started to do in changing a culture in the office that you now run. You inherited an office that was fully staffed by people you didn't hire, many of whom I imagine don't share many of your views and vehemently disagree with much of what your platform was about. So I'm very curious about how you think about using your time to try and change a culture. I mean, presumably you can't fire an entire staff, although maybe that's part of what the plan is, but I'd love to hear your plans about that. Sure, excellent question. So, yeah, I mean, the program I did at Harvard Business School, which was exceptional, it's like an eight-month program on change leadership. Everywhere in our sort of dorms, it said, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And I think people don't understand how strong cultures are. Um, you know, what's beautiful is there are many people, so the, one of the individuals I ran against was in the office supported by Dan Conley, the sitting DA, and every former commissioner of Boston police dating back to like 05 BC. Um, so, and not Boston College, like before Christ, right? So, um, so what's interesting is everyone in the office supported that individual too. So it's, 
you have to kind of put your ego aside and realize I wasn't coming from the Middlesex DA's office or the Essex DA's office or some other DA's office where I could say, I won all of, like Jerry Maguire, like who's coming with me to all of you guys, right? And I bring 40 people in and I fire 40 people and we're up and running on the first day. Um, we're much more deliberate than that. And so I've thought really hard about my transition team, right? So one of the biggest things, this is another big piece of news, is I had um, 40 people on my transition team. I had a six person steering committee. We had the um, head of the CJA list, so is a really um, very excellent lawyer who's a, a criminal defense lawyer, Jessica Hedges. I had Natasha Tidwell, uh, who was not only one of my closest friends, but the first um, female lieutenant in the history of the Cambridge Police Department, black woman. Um, I had um, the first black female justice on the SJC, retired Geraldine Hines. Um, so I had law enforcement, but I also had some faces that people weren't used to seeing. Um, and then I had returning citizens. So I had people that served 17 years in federal time that have turned their life around, that are interviewing people in the, U in the DA's office. And people lost their mind. And I loved it, because on Jeff Cooner, he was like, these people are, can you believe it? And I'm like, right, you mean the people that we prosecute every day and know about the criminal justice system more than you? Yes, those people, those very people are on our transition team. So I think it's messaging, but it's also showing up and doing the work. Like, I'm really proud that my first assistant and general counsel have gone off to Cy Vance's DA's office in Manhattan, Larry Krasner's in Philadelphia. I'm not going anywhere. I just show up to work every day. I'm usually one of the first people in, and I am frequently working in the middle of the night sending people emails at three o'clock in the morning but it's going to be you know like remember the titans right attitude reflects leadership we're going to lead and we're going to teach them um, exactly how it is we would like this done and we're going to give them an opportunity to get on board and then what's beautiful about having actually managed and led groups of people before is if you're not on board we're going to help you get the next job you have because you aren't going to be working here. Uh, so, you know, I have started a massive culture change in small things like we now have a weekly senior staff meeting, which people were like, what? And I was like, right, we're going to all meet together and learn what the other people are doing in our office. Um, we are going to have quarterly all staff meetings. They would only meet once a year at like the Christmas party. And so you got to understand in Suffolk County, we have eight or nine divisions of the Boston Municipal Court. We have the Chelsea District Court, and then we have Suffolk Superior Court. They're all in different places. So those divisions of Boston Municipal Court, they show up at those places. They don't come to one bullfinch where I go every day. So it's siloed, and people don't know what the other people are doing. So we're going to have a monthly newsletter, and we're going to be, um, I show up in court sometimes and say hello to people. Um, it, these are things that in the 16 years that my predecessor had the job, it was just a different place. Like the doors were locked to the seventh floor, which is the executive floor. So your swipe pass, even though you work in the building, didn't work to come in. So you'd be like standing outside, like me at Prada, right? Where I'm like, no, I want that purse, let me in, right? So, um, so, Anyways, like I, I, we have unlocked the doors, right? So there are, you know, my, my five-year-old niece had a fake tummy ache this morning and then ate two donuts with Detective Cecil on the way into work. But my five-year-old niece was running around the office this morning for an hour until my dad showed up. And I'm not going to hide the fact that I have children and, you know, we aren't going to smuggle her in in a, you know, in a suitcase or something. Like, people have kids. we got to take care of ourselves. We're going to be fine. So I think the culture is changing enormously. Um, you know, there's never been a female elected DA in the history of Suffolk County. There was one woman who was excellent who was appointed by the governor in an acting role. Um, but what's beautiful is we're changing things just by showing up every day. And so we have to just keep showing up and keep doing the work. Um, and surrounding myself with very smart people um, and being really true to what it is that I said, um, even if it's not 
if, if it's not easy. Hello, my name is Marlena Connolly, and just on behalf of the student body, I want to thank you. Um, you mentioned Larry Krasner. I'm actually from Philadelphia, and I'm from one of the poorest neighborhoods in North Philadelphia. And a lot of the things that you said I really could resonate with, and I want to let you know how breathtaking it is for a woman of color to sit there and kind of see a reflection of my future self. You know, it's kind of like I see myself 20 years from now, and I want to thank you 20. for giving me no, hope. I want to... <laughs> 30, 30. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> I want, no, 10, five, five, four years from now. <laughs> I want to thank you for giving me hope. I want to thank you uh, for serving as an example. Um, I worked actually at the district attorney's office in Philadelphia for five years prior to moving out here. And I went through those times where I literally had to recuse myself as the district attorney's representative because my blood cousin was on you know, the list. In Philadelphia, we had more murders last year than days of the week, so like I said, People like you, I thank you for what you are doing. Seriously, like you, this was a life-changing experience for me. Excuse my attire, but last minute. <laughs> no, I, 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 I usually, you know, dress to impress, but last minute I got out of something else and I said I had to be here. Um, so please excuse me for that. But I'd like to, um, if you could just give advice to me as a one, like did you always know that you wanted to be district attorney? What was, give us a view of you in my shoes, you know, uh, as a 1L one, one in law sure. school. I love it. So I was, no, I did not always know that I wanted to do that. In fact, when you hear, I was the first intern in the history of the NBA Players Association. I had a, a, a scholarship to play lacrosse in college. I was sure I was going to be the first female executive director of the NBA Players Association. For sure. <laughs> and, and, uh, and there is a female executive director now. I will find her. No. Um, <laughs> No, 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 she's wonderful, uh, but that's what I wanted to be. Okay. And what, what was interesting was I actually graduated from law school. Tara, Tara remember this. I graduated from law school. I went to work. So in sports, there's like labor issues and antitrust issues. Like those are the two big things that you have to sort of be a specialist in if you're going to, obviously criminal law is another issue that sports deals with, but I'm just talking about if you're in-house counsel at, a, at the MB, NBA Players Association, we, we are governed by a collective bargaining agreement, we have grievances, we negotiate all this stuff, and we're always fighting like the antitrust stuff. I knew I didn't want to do the antitrust stuff, right. so I went to the National Labor Relations Board, became an expert in labor law, worked at Bingham McCutcheon, who at the time represented the Kraft family, which, by the way, Patriots, what? All right, anyways, right. Represented the Kraft family and the Yockey family, which owned the Red Sox, wow. okay? And I was like, oh, yes, I'm gonna be, like, representing the Kraft family and the Red Sox. They were like, we have a case for you, Rachel, for the Red Sox. And I was like, oh, my God, this is it. And I opened it, and it was, like, a, literally a certified, like, a certified, I think the person was at Mass Mental, mm -hmm. um, who said, like, I own the Red Sox. And I was like, this, this is the case? And so I filed an answer that said, like, no, you don't, sir. Um, so that was, like, the extent of my big, like, and then, and then the Yaki family sold the Red Sox, and we didn't represent the Crafts anymore. And I started doing other types of work, and I was super disappointed, but I bounced. And I, not bounced, like, left, but I, I adapted, right? I moved and adapted and started right. doing different types of law, okay. met some wonderful people who mentored me, and did the DA rotation, wow. and then went to the US Attorney's Office, and then started in the civil division first, and then criminal, and then all of these different, I took advantage of every opportunity I could. I grabbed mentors, and not just people of color, and not just women, grouchy old you know people that we it appeared that we didn't have a lot in common right. but i worked hard and i worked for them Absolutely. when you if you watch my inauguration the people that were there hugging me and crying are people that you'd say like how are these two people even speaking to each other right. but you have to open your eyes to different opportunities and then the work is the most important thing. Like I love to say, it's great I'm the first woman, I'm the first that. My dad says to me all the time, no one cares that you're a woman, no one cares what color you are, are you gonna do a good job? Absolutely. And so I want you working hard, I want excellent grades. Um, call me, 
you know, we can talk about it later, but I want you taking advantage of opportunities, but your work must be excellent. Absolutely. Right. Thank you very Good much. Luck. Sorry, sorry. See you. Uh, so if someone wants to build a, if, imagine if you had a, uh, a factory, you said, uh, I want to have a factory, I want to make silk. But if you, if, instead of getting silk, they sell you plastic. It doesn't matter how good your employers are, you're not going to get a silk product at the end. Um, so a lot of what you're going to be doing as a DA, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming, uh, will be a product of information that you get. Uh, so my question to you is, uh, the information that you be getting from police officers, um, are you going to build a connection, a, a, a talk with you know police officers, or are you going to build relationships? Uh, how how is that going to go? Yeah. So, um, am I the silk? I don't. I'm like I want to. Uh, but no, no, no. Good, good question. We we are. We can't operate without each other, right? So, um, so I am working on building relationships with the police. And, but what I love to say is I don't report to them. They don't report to me, but I don't report to them. Um, what's beautiful about Massachusetts is with homicides, we are one of the only states in the United States where from the investigation all the way to the prosecution, the DA has exclusive jurisdiction over the homicide. So in most other places, the police do the investigation, the district attorney does the prosecution piece. Now for search warrants and other things like that, they're in constant com communication with us. But in Massachusetts, for the arrest to happen, they call us to say, can we arrest, right? Can we do this? Um, what I made a choice to do is day one, I show up at homicides. We are fortunate in Massachusetts, um, people love to say this, but we have a black commissioner of police for Boston Police. We have a black sheriff um, in, in, of Suffolk County House of Corrections. I am a black woman, so we have a black DA. Um, and everyone's like, in the media, who nobody's black in Boston in the media, by the way, but they're like, oh, we have three black people that are all doing this. And I'm like, and? like you're all white, are you all doing stuff together? Like, I don't even know what this question means. But I think what they're realizing is that black people are just like you, right? We, we just, our commissioner is conservative leaning law enforcement who has black skin. I am a progressive prosecutor who looks at my role as bigger than just putting people in jail. Um, I believe that we uh, have an obligation to explain the process to people, to level the playing field, and to make sure that whether you are in West Roxbury or Roxbury, you're going to get the same outcome, um, period, end of story. So I am going to hold, and I hold the police accountable. I mean, unlike them, we investigate law enforcement at times. When there are officer involved shootings, it's my office that does that. So I think it's important that although we work together, that there is a line that we have between us. And I am also going out to the community and saying, if you're not comfortable going to the police, because there's mistrust oftentimes in certain communities, then I want you to come to me. So I don't know whether that's silk or plastic, but I can tell you, um, I'm working hard at the relationship, but it's not, it, I think there has to be some space between us in order for us to each operate. Now I speak to the commissioner almost daily. We just had very good news earlier today where there was a missing person that was found yesterday, I believe, um, and he said, we're about to do a press conference, do you want to come? And I said, nope, I have a, you know, I have a, you'll fine with that, but thank you for letting me know. We talked about what we thought some of the charges might be and moving forward, but we have a good relationship, but I think there needs to be space if we're going to operate well, um, and I'm going to do my job, because there could come a time where I'm investigating something that his, the people that report to him do. But you're right. Thank you.
So again, I just want to say thank you to all of you for coming up this afternoon, and a huge thank you to Rachel, who she called me this morning. She's like, okay, what's going on? She's like, don't worry, I won't disappoint you. So <laughs> I was like, I'm not worried. I know you're going to make me look good. So, um, and you did, so thank you, my dear. Uh, I just want to, again, thank Nixon Peabody for your support of, uh, of today's lecture. And I also want to acknowledge and thank the Black Law Students Association and the Criminal Law Society and the Latino, Latina Law Students Association and the Multicultural Law Students Association for co-sponsoring today's event. Um, I have a gift for you. I left it in my office, so we'll go down and get it. So <laughs> don't think we're cheap and not giving her a gift. We've got one. I just forgot to bring it. Um, so thank you all again. Have a wonderful evening, and we hope to see you again next year.